Hello, welcome to WordWise, where we take familiar passages of the Bible, and sometimes not so familiar, and try to take them a little bit deeper. I'm your delve host, Delve deeply. Brian. You missed the phrase. Sorry. Welcome to WordWise, where we delve deeply into familiar and sometimes also we learn to apply them to our lives. That's what I normally hear. Well, it's because you're not paying Sorry, attention. welcome to the podcast. Hi, welcome Episode to... Episode number 20. Leafline. Episode number 20? No, sorry, 21, actually. Good grief, Charlie Brown. That's just a lot of episodes. I'm we... astonished people are still listening, if they <sighs> are. If they are. But thank you for listening, if you are. Welcome. We're glad you joined us. Uh, I am Brian Rawls, Senator Associate of the Pastor at Senator Church. And that guy over there, not as far away as normal, like five miles away this time. He's Ben Akina. He's ben and director. Brian are very different, but they both love email. And so if you want to write to us, centenary1911 at gmail.com, or you could just comment in this YouTube video. Please communicate with us. We're lonely. So lonely. Can I get an update? Can I get an update? You just were waiting for me to sing that. I know that. Hi. Uh, updates this week. We uh, don't have a lot to share because it's really hot. And so the in-person activities were suspended due to the heat this week. But we were and we are planning to do Tuesday night youth in person here at Centenary and Wednesday night in person uh, children's ministry, kingdom kids, families, those are obviously outside and obviously social distancing, masked, and all those other fun precautions. But this week they are virtual and back online and back in Zoom because it's so hot. Yes. And for next week, they might still – next week the temperature is supposed to be 103 on Wednesday and 106 on Tuesday. So they might still be out next week, which I guess would be the 25th and 26th. Something but like that. But in September, hopefully we get to meet – Maybe in October. Who knows? This conversation is making me sad. Yes, it's making me very sad too. So let's move well, on. Let's stop updating. Recommendations. Give it a try. Recommendations. Recommendations. I don't uh, have any. I thought Do we were doing what anything? you're watching, what you're listening to, and all so, that. Well, we'll it's merge the, these the recommendations two. section. Uh, okay, recommendations. So, so I'm merging my what I'm listening to and what I'm recommending. So I am listening to a lot of audiobooks as always. And so there's a fiction book, several books that um, I will actually recommend because they're a good read. If you're into a fiction book and you want just a good story, it does have some adult language and a little bit oh, of it's a, got adult words. content. I don't, I don't care for yes. Potty words. I, I just want to warn you, and some of you already read these, I'm sure, but I actually finally read the third one. Um, so it's a, an author by the odd name of Graham Simpson, S I M S I O N. So it's a very weird name. He is Australian, so I'll cut him some slack. He actually was 50 years old. He's an IT guy and decided to make a complete change in his life and become an author and write books. And his first book he wrote over the course of like, I don't know, eight years. It was a screenplay originally. It's called The Rosie Project. It was it turned into a book in 2012 or something like that. Then he went on to write two other books in that series. So Rosie Project, the second one is Rosie Effect and Effect, and the third one is The Rosie Result. I read the first one, Catherine, I loved it. It was very good, just a good fiction book. Second book, yeah, yeah. So I was gonna just stop there, but then I just recently read the third one and it was very good. So I'm gonna recommend all three of those. So if you just want a good read to distract yourself, it's a really good character, really good series. So give it a try. And I've also been listening to music that some of you may like. And guess what, Ben? I'm back into my Broadway phase. You're kidding. Yeah, sorry about that. You would actually say I probably never left. Uh, Pasek and Paul are the composers, and they have written well-known things like The Greatest Showman and La La Land and Dear Evan Hansen. I've actually discovered some of their early stuff, and it's, it's almost as good. So they wrote a, a Broadway show version of A Christmas Story, if you can believe that. And it's actually pretty good. And then a catchy couple tunes out of a show called Dogfight. So give Pasek and Paul a try. If you listen to Greatest Showman, it's great fun. It's a great uh, film as well. And then Dear Evan Hansen is my personal favorite. So there you go. Fair enough. I'm going to say what I've been watching, but I will not tell people to give it a try. Uh the Secret Life of Walter Mitty is a movie featuring Ben Stiller that came out five years ago, maybe. What I didn't know, my wife did, what I didn't know at the time was that it was a remake of a movie featuring the very talented Danny Kaye. From a long time ago. A long yep. time ago. Yep. Uh, we watched it, uh, I think we watched about 45 minutes to an hour of it. He's so insanely talented 
and that's very, very clear from this movie. There were a few good chuckles. Uh, I will probably not be finishing the movie because it just really, really didn't grab me. I was impressed by the craft of his performance, not really grabbed by the story. So that's unfortunate because I, I liked Danny Kaye and I wish there was more of him in pop culture. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's an f- amazingly gifted and talented uh, individual from his peak would have been, what, the 50s? I don't even know, actually. So Yeah, I think so. Yeah, long before I was born. He's usually not. the best part of all the mediocre movies that he's in. Yep, yep. He shines in a lot of ways. He's the watchable part of White Christmas. Where else can you find such timely commentary? Talking about Danny Kaye in 2020. That's right. That's us. Welcome to Leafline yet again. Trivia. On to stories. Story No, time. trivia. We don't have any story time. Last week, our question was the category of Bible minutia. Question. When Israel's best and brightest were taken captive to Babylon, the Bible names four young men who set themselves apart from the rest because they refused to what? Brian, do you know the answer? They refused to wear a mask, Ben. They were kicked out of Babylon because they wouldn't well, wear a mask. Well, they should have been kicked out of Babylon. I agree. But no, they were not eating of the king's table because it was not of their training to do so. Brian knew that. Carrie Sampson also knew that. She specified her in, her in her email. They couldn't have eaten from the king's table because it wouldn't have been kosher. It wasn't kosher, you know. <laughs> Sorry, new question. This category is local legend. Question. Before he was blowing up planets and excavating the Ark of the Covenant, George Lucas made a much more personal film that was inspired by his experiences growing up in our very town of Modesto. What was that movie called? You can send your trivia answer to centenary1911 at gmail.com. Now, Brian, I so felt like there's this... Certain, <laughs> sorry, there's certain of you that we best hear from you like immediately because I know you know I it. expect to hear from you before we finish recording this yes. podcast. In fact, you should have a vision coming to you right now. You need to email us and... Yeah, you know it, and we want to hear the answer sense from you. Be tingling. Yeah, the younger ones they may not remember it. Or yeah, may not kids know don't it. like Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I, I thought that question might be a little bit too easy. So I've got another question that it's very unlikely we'll get a response for. And yes, I'm throwing down the gauntlet, listeners of the show. So this is historical combat. The category. Speaking a of formation gauntlets. of. Throwing down the gauntlet, historical reference, Ben, way to go. Wow, it's like doubling yeah. stuff. Okay, a formation of interlock shields with spears protruding was a hallmark of trained soldiers in ancient Greece. What is the Greek name for this military formation from which we get our modern scientific word for toe bones, phalanges? Phalanges with a PH. Big clue, big question, big deal. Wow. Big story. Nice job. Story time, because the lockdown is boring. Story time. So welcome to Ralston Recollections, Ralston the part Recollections, of the show where yes. Brian tells a story. Do you have one today? It's like a VeggieTales setup or something. Yes. Uh, actually, sure, I do. It's uh, kind of lame, but that's okay. I'll warn you. Uh, so, yes, in uh, several parts of my life, for some reason, people have – not only misspelled my name, but they have uh, oh, yes. called me by an entirely different name. So my name is Brian Scott Ralston. None of those names are complicated or even unusual. Ralston, maybe slightly, maybe I used not. to pronounce it Ralston when yeah. I first met you, and you yeah. disabused me of that notion very quickly. I did, indeed. And yes, a uh, little bit of trivia. The founder of Modesto was I actually about using a dude. This as a trivia question. Oh, well, too late. I'm giving it away. William Chapman Ralston was the dude who was responsible for Modesto in many ways. He was a banker, uh, lived in the Bay Area. Uh, The town of Belmont is where he had a summer place. There's a Ralston Hall and a Ralston Boulevard there. But he worked with the big four to build the railroads. And as they were building the railroad down through the Central Valley, he's the one that chose this spot for a railroad depot, railroad station. And the ranchers around this area were so grateful they were going to name the city that was going to be the town there, name it after him. And But he, uh, depending which side of the story you want to hear, he was this wealthy, successful banker dude from San Francisco, didn't want a podunk cow town named after him. So he refused the honor. 
The Spanish ranchers in the area thought he was being humble. El señor es muy modesto. Exactly. So from his perspective, he was kind of a jerk, but from the local ranchers, he was modest. So thus, Modesto was founded. So yes, you could have been living in Ralston, California, and wouldn't I have been obnoxious then? I was first told that story when my- You would be insufferable. I'm already pretty obnoxious. That would have made it way worse. But that's not the story I wanted to tell. Even though that's a fun story. That was a good story, story though. Uh, so, yes, for some reason, my name has gotten misspelled to Byron many times, Brain many times. Even you a say few times. Byron, but I think of Byron with a Y and an O. When I know. I see it spelled, I think, Biron. Biron, yes. Like it's an Indian. That's good, Eastern yes. Indian. So not only people misspelled it, they uh, have actually just given me an entirely different name like Kevin or <laughs> Peter. So one famous uh, place that I visited in seminary on a regular basis, a Dunkin' Donuts of all places. Uh, my buddies and I would go there late to get coffee and donuts to fuel up for study sessions and all that kind of stuff. For some reason, the owner there was determined my name should be Peter. So every time I walked in, he would yell joyfully, Peter, because he was so excited to see me. And what's funny about that is my friends thought that that was my middle name because my nephew was named Peter and they thought there might have been like a family connection or something. So several of them actually thought that I preferred to be called Peter. <laughs> and so they, uh, several of them actually seriously started calling me Peter or Pete. And I just was like, oh, my gosh, please know there's already enough Pete's and Peter's in my family. Don't need that additional thing. And that is just one of those times when you just kind of shake your head and go, why is this happening? But so, yes, I'm not sure how I became Kevin and Peter, but those names have actually occurred multiple times throughout my life. For some reason, when people want to get an entirely different name for me, they go with Kevin or Peter. Usually Peter. I don't know why. So there you go. Main topic. Welcome to main topic. So today, we're sorry. talking about names today, believe it or not. So we, ha I, I'll own this. I've been fascinated by name changes and names in general, especially. It's not just you. I'm fascinated okay. by name changes too. Okay, good. All right. So geography is where it first has come up. And there's been so many efforts uh, over, for many different reasons, to change the names of places. And it is rarely successful unless you have an army to back it up, or unless it's done by force or unless there's a real significant change like a country like the USSR breaks up into the Russian various Russian republics and such. So there has to be some dramatic event like that to make the name change stick, or you have to have an army to back it up. Mm. Um, examples of this, uh, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe only when there was a revolution and essentially a changeover of a pretty significant nature. Myanmar, Myanmar yeah. yeah, Myanmar became is used to be Burma, and things like that uh, change only because there's revolutions or military uh, power. When humans try to change names just for the fun of it, it often doesn't take, doesn't stick, and I've always been kind of amused. If by it's that. anything larger than a street, it it definitely doesn't stick. Right, right. Yeah, you can change a street name, and many many have done that. But to change a city's name, to change a state's name, a country's name is a much bigger proposition. And I just have found that some reason interesting. And the Bible actually talks a lot about name changes. There's actually a theology of name changes. And if I could personalize this for a moment, I started realizing this when I was doing junior high ministry back in Clovis. It, it started with me not being able to remember names of students. That's one of the things I've always been very weak in. And as a method of sort of helping myself out and also ingratiating myself to the students, if a new student came, I wouldn't bother learning their name. I would give them a nickname from the very first night they were at youth group. And the nickname was usually something about their personality or appearance or whatever, or something funny they said that I knew I'd be able to remember. And it worked really well. And I started thinking about why did that work well? Why does the student accept this new nickname from me? And I started realizing that it was a sign of familiarity. It was a sign of ownership. Uh, you might be Jeff to everybody else in the world, but when you show up and I call you Red Ranger, you know, and it's 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 a name that is given based on sort of achievement, something you've accomplished or at least something interesting and distinct about you rather than, oh, that's the name they put on a piece of paper before anyone knew anything about me or what mattered to me. Right. And I started realizing this was kind of a name of ownership. You're Jeff to the rest of the world. But when I call you Red Ranger, that's a sign of affection and of ownership. And I started seeing that pop up also in my study of scripture. 
And that was so interesting to me how often a person in the Bible would have a name and then somebody else would give them a new name and it designated those same things. It designated a relationship and it kind of designated this change of ownership. You are Jeff to the world, but I see you now and you belong to me in a weird way. Right, right. And it happens a lot. It goes all the way back to Genesis. And if you think about it, uh, even the patriarch of the faith in many ways, Abraham, wasn't originally called Abraham. He was called Abram. And when God made his covenant with him and when God established this relationship and this new connection with Abram, he became Abraham and his wife went from Sarai to Sarah. And so those don't seem like that big of a changes, but they're totally different names. And the same happens with Jacob becoming Israel. Israel yeah. And throughout the Bible, you see this where there's a significant milestone event where the person is essentially given a new name by God. And it's to signify special relationship, special connection, and you belong to me. You belong with me now. I do want to mention as an asterisk, there is one in the Old Testament that does not denote this specific mm -hmm. thing, and that's uh, Naomi. Yes. She decides to change her own name because she's now self-identifying as something that's broken. So what's that's it, just a Yeah, what's interesting about note. that is Naomi means... Um, Actually, I'm going to mess this up. Mara means bitterness. Bitter and jaded. Yeah. yeah. So she changes her name to bitter and jaded because that's, but that's her personal choice. God is not changing her name. And God is actually providing for her in some pretty significant ways, which she'll find out later. But yeah, that's an example of, of essentially the opposite. But in God's terms, a name gets changed for specific, important relational reasons and you see it throughout the Old Testament, but you also see it in the New Testament. And I've always found this Can rather fun. Can the second most oh, interesting yeah. one from the New Testament? Go for it. I, I love the story of uh, Saul of Tarsus. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't exactly remember where exactly his name changed in the book of Acts, but I like this distinction. I mean, he talks about in Colossians 3, I think it is, when he's writing a letter to the Church of Colossae. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, you know, you must put aside the old creation and become a new person. He did that in his name when he became Paul. Mm -hmm. And Saul was a person that was brought up by the Sanhedrin. He was raised in the Hebrew faith. Paul is a servant of Christ, a slave of Christ. Yeah, and a slave of Christ. I like that that denotes <clears throat> that new ownership, that new identity even in a very cool way. And it, his name actually gets changed when he's heading out on his first missionary journey. Mm. And it's the idea of he was Saul, his Hebrew name. And not only is that his past but he's now uh, Paul. Paulos is his ministry name to the Greek world. He's, he is fluent in Greek. He is educated as a Greek. And now he's going to be ministering to the Greek world in many ways. Still ministers to, to Jews, Hebrews, obviously, too. So, but his name changes to signify ownership, personal relationship, and a new mission, a new, new ministry, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of fun. And, yeah, that's, that's one of the famous ones that I think is very important to look at. The other one from the New Testament that everybody's familiar with is great one. Peter. And what was his name before? Simon. 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 So what's interesting about that is Jesus changed his name to Peter. And Peter means rock. We know that. On this rock, I will build my church and all that good stuff. But what's fun for me is there's always this little hint of humor there because Jesus knows Peter really well and they're friends and they've been uh, essentially... Uh, traveling together for years, and Jesus names him Peter because Peter also, as a rock, uh, he's the one that walks in the water, remember? <laughs> and when he takes Briefly. his eyes off Jesus, he sinks like a stone rock. And I think that's just a little little humorous kind of aside there, and it's it shows up in a couple other places where Jesus is kind of teasing his friends, and that humor is so relational and so so fun for me. So, yeah, Jesus changes Peter's name Partially because relationship, new identity, and new mission. So if Jesus too. describes new names based partly on humor, does that mean uh, James and John were very flatulent? Uh, Get it? Get it? Yeah. Oh, uh, Sons of Thunder, which sounds like a motorcycle gang or a wrestling name or something, but they were the Sons of Thunder, which also means they argued a lot. They were temperamental. They were angry at times, and I think that's also a little jab. Um, yeah, so there's definitely some fun going on there. Um, other name changes in New Testament terms, you see, a, you know, just sort of a, several of the disciples are known by multiple names. And then as Christians were baptized, they often took a new name. This actually still exists in some hmm. cultures. Oh, you get your baptism name. Yeah, your baptism yeah. name. Exactly. And especially in African cultures, even in the Catholic Church, 
There's a lot of, uh, you choose a, a, your christening name you're in the Catholic Church, and a lot of African cultures, you choose your baptismal name. I had good friends in seminary who were liberty and freedom and witness, and I thought, I those, are, Max those, Power. Are, those are such cool names. How, and, well, that's not the actual name <laughs> in their family. That was what they chose when they were baptized as an adult or when they became a Christian, and so that's just kind of fun. So it still happens today in many ways. Um, and getting different names ascribed to a person or the, the, the origin of a name is, is not something that's exclusive to the Hebrew culture. Brian, you and I were talking just yesterday about how much we like this subject in general about what different names from around the world mean and how a name is ascribed. We talked about how last names, the way we know them, don't go back all that far in human history. If you look at the cultures out of the ancient Near East, your last name is kind of just literally translated to son of so-and-so. Yeah, yeah. In uh, Hebrew culture, there's a lot of names in the Bible. It'll be like Jacob Ben Alburn, and his his middle name is not Ben. Ben means son of. Right. Which and makes my name really boring. Yes. Uh, son of my right hand is Benjamin. That is correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, and th- there's so many interesting things where the Hebrew, that's the way they would, they would do it. They would essentially, you'd be known as son of Joseph, son In of... In Arabic culture, it's the same thing, except yeah. for them, it's Ibn instead of Ben. And we talked about this too in a lot of uh, Norse history, uh, Erikson. Mm-hmm. Literally means son of Eric, uh, so, Algot daughter, yep. daughter of Algot. Daughter of Algot. So the Scandinavian cultures always went with that, similar to the Hebrew cultures, which is just kind of fun that there's that overlap. Then you get to the Western world yeah. and European. And what's your last name indicate, Ben? Uh, that's your job. Yeah. It's, it's how the ruling class sees you. You, you are a copper smith. You, yeah. you are a goldsmith. You are a shoemaker. So your name becomes shoemaker, coppersmith, whatever. I'm Jacob Miller. Guess what my job is? <laughs> so that's it's a very Miller Smith, cook, tailor, weaver, thatcher, baker. Yeah, there's a ton of them, aren't there? Yeah, I, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So those kids didn't get asked on the first day of kindergarten what they want to be when they grow up. No, it was that old way where you were what your parents, you know, told you to be. Essentially, you're followed in the family business or whatever, and your name indicated that for generations. And in some cases, um, my favorite was always farmer. You know, what would what, you do for a living? Um, I was a blacksmith, but, you know, got really confused. My last name was Farmer. So. <laughs> Identify as a farmer. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so we talked about, I mean, names are significant the world over. And I think, you know, it's, it's not exclusive to Hebrew culture, but even Hebrew culture, your name is Jacob Ben Abraham or, or whatever the case may be. I think that's something that makes name changes in scripture even more significant because your name in all these cultures we've just described describes your destiny. It says Mm -hmm. who you are. And then God roars into your life and says, I'm giving you a new name. And that's not just a nickname. That's not just a sign of our relationship. He's changing your destiny. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You're part of a new family. You've been adopted. You, you've been brought into a family of faith. And a lot of times that's a pretty significant event. And it's also in the early church, especially, it would have been a, a life-saving event in many ways because you were excommunicated from the oh, yeah. previous life that you had. So if you were Jewish and you converted to Christianity in the you first century. You were cutting century, ties. Yeah. Yeah. You, your family had a funeral. They would act like you were dead. Your and Betov was gone. Yes. Yeah, you the, lost the reason your Naomi house. changed her name to Mara is because she had no future left, because she had no family left to hold on to. And that's, I guess, what you're saying, the same thing that would happen to a person who became a believer mm-hmm. in that heavily Jewish culture. Mm-hmm. You're, you're cutting yourself off from your, your lifeline, from your destiny, from your future, from your lineage. Ow. Yeah. And so what's interesting is in the modern age, the cultures that do the name change when you become a Christian, a lot of them also come from a place where you were, you lost your biological family and your biological uh, connections, and then your community also was lost. So in some of those African cultures I mentioned, if they're heavily Islamic or if they're Mm. uh, tribal in some way, by becoming a Christian, you're in some ways disconnected and in some ways actually disconnected that people shun you and will not talk with you anymore. And so you lose that community. So you need to be adopted into a new community even with your name. And so that's, that's where that comes from a lot of times. So it's such an interesting reality. And so, uh, again, your identity has changed. You're now uh, given a new name. 
And what's fun about all this is if you read all the way through the book of Revelation, this concept continues because in some of those uh, future promises, especially even in the letter to the churches, the chapters two and three of Revelation, one of the promises that's given is God will give you a new name. If you endure and persevere through difficult times and stay true and continue to walk strong in Jesus, uh, one of the promises that's given is you'll be given a new name. You'll be given a white stone with your new name on it. And that sometimes that's even referred to as a secret name that's only between you and God. So in a place of persecution where you would have been shamed and your name ripped to shreds by the Roman Empire, or the government or the city in which you lived and you would have been persecuted for being a Christian and your name drug through the mud. It's such an interesting thing that one of the promises is if you persevere through that persecution, you're given a new name that will be free from that shame, free from that label, free from whatever happened. And sometimes that's an interesting promise to hold on to. One of my favorite passages comes out of the book of Isaiah. I think it's 65 or 66 chapter. Um, and God promises even to the eunuchs, the people with no lineage that's going to come behind them, uh, I will give them a name that is better than sons and daughters. I will give them a hope and a future. And a, I love that. He, he promises a lineage to people that are completely cut off and, and have no future in the realest sense of the word. Yeah. Yeah, even if even if you have no future, even if you have no family heritage, even if you have no uh, no inheritance, no better uh, yeah, no father's house, no anything, you're adopted into God's family. You're adopted through Jesus Christ, and that's an amazing uh, reality of what Christ accomplished on the cross. And an aspect we don't talk too much about, but it's so important because you're now adopted as a son or daughter. You're no longer an orphan. You're no longer abandoned or alone. You're adopted as a son or daughter, and as part of that a new name. And that's just a fun reality that I think is so, uh, uh, it, it's comforting. It's, it's, it's that what love does. And I, I like that so much. One last word before we go. So as we close, thanks for joining us. We wanted to uh, be a little more light this week just because we just were um, so intense last week. But uh, as we close, <laughs> we I were wanted... a little more self-indulgent this week. Yeah, exactly. So hope you enjoyed our little discussion. Let us know. And if you have any comments, questions, or snarky remarks, please feel free to email us or comment on the YouTube. And uh, But just upcoming things we want to remind you about. We are making a big effort to start some Zoom small groups. We yes. are uh, disconnected and some are struggling with isolation. And so we really want to work together to connect together. So we're starting a bunch of Zoom small groups over the next few weeks. There'll be four starting up uh, the week of August 24th. And then a few more also coming. So if you have an interest in this, even if you don't have an interest in this, pray about it and we want you to join in. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what time of day or day of the week you're interested in. We can find a group for you. So please let us know if you're interested. You can email that in or let us know and we'll get in contact with you. There's going to be signups coming in your email and the leaf brief on Friday. So please jump on that and join a group. Bye. Bye. Bye.